Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. Today I want to take a quick look at some of the things from the first three episodes of Better Call Saul Season 4. A friendly warning to all. If you aren't caught up on all of Better Call Saul and all of Breaking Bad, there will be spoilers in this video. So viewers, please be warned. They range from 39% to 58% pure, except this one, which hovers around 67. Uh, that sample you asked me to run, I ran it, and it is quite good. These samples aren't great. In fact, they're, um, they're, they're not even good. I can guarantee you a purity of 96%. I'm proud of that figure. Basically, they're dreck. I could do much better. Gale. Much higher grade. It's a hard-earned figure. 96. However, this other product is 99. Maybe even a touch beyond that. I could make a kilo or more right here. No one would know. Wouldn't take more than a few days. That last 3%, it may not sound like a lot, but it is. So right now we can see a clear path to victory for Gus. And when I say victory... I'm not referring to his brilliant scheme that saw him defeat Don Eladio. I'm talking about Gus reaching the status he'd obtained when we first learned about his operation on Breaking Bad. When Gus warned Juan Bolsa of trouble ahead, Bolsa looked as if he knew Gus was right, but little did he realize that Gus would be the one orchestrating all the trouble. It's a strong play by Gus, and now Bolsa is actually ordering Frank to find a local supplier. This was Gus's endgame all along, and this vision of his probably dates back to his earlier meeting that went awry with Eladio. That incident seemed to do nothing but deepen Gus's resolve. Gus's handling of Gale is equally clever here. There's no doubt that Gus knew Gale could produce a product that was far superior to the shipbag samples he gave him. Fring is playing the long game here, and he already knows that he will have Gale's loyalty when needed. So everything is going so well for Gus at the moment that I find it impossible to believe that he won't soon be confronted by a difficult, unforeseen obstacle. I'm assuming the Salamanca crew will get their shit together so that Gus has some type of challenge ahead. Personally, I'd be very interested in getting more information about Gus's past, regarding the stuff that happened before he left Chile, and exactly what Eladio knew about his past on that fateful meeting where Gus lost his first cook. But regardless of whatever Gus does from here, it's doubtful he will ever have a bigger blunder than when he inexplicably allowed Walter White to step in for Gal. Bad move, Gus. Very bad move. Hey, it's me. Listen, I got something for you. It's a job. Plan's fine as far as it goes. It's just not for me. And I don't think it should be for you either. Listen, look, the office guy, he's here. What? He's dug in for the night, man. Yes, sliced, please. Could you also throw in some dipping sticks? This place, they don't cut their pizza and they pass the savings on to you. What savings? How much can it be to cut a damn pizza? Hey, hey, hey. Mike gave Jimmy a stern warning that foreshadowed the problems that would result from the Hummel-swapping scheme, and Jimmy's new thief Ira definitely lacked the due diligence he would have gotten from Mike. Ira basically marched into the office, missing the pillow on the couch, and he got himself in a bad spot. Jimmy's innovative solution seemed to save the day, but perhaps the troubles here aren't quite over yet. Ira didn't seem to be paying especially careful attention to the details when he made the swap. And if he missed the pillow in the office he was robbing, who's to say he didn't miss any cameras or anything else that might later incriminate him? The interviewer might not be the sharpest guy in the world, and he should have known better than to buy his lady friend a vacuum, even if it was top of the line. But to me, he seems the type that will definitely get the authorities involved over his runaway car. A towering figure in the Albuquerque legal community who built one of the leading law firms in the Southwest. Nothing will ever change the fact that we are brothers, flesh and blood. Charles graduated valedictorian from Francis Xavier High School at the age of 14. Making him the youngest graduate in the history of that school. And though we are very different people, I want you to know how much I respect what you have made of yourself in these last few years. Charles led the debate team to national championship three years running and won the Larkin Prize. You have taken the opportunity I gave you in the mailroom 
and you have run with it, becoming a valued member of the HHM family. Charles made his mark in many areas of the law. I'm certain now that no matter what the future may bring, you'll land on your feet, and I hope when you read this, you remember me not only as your brother, but as a person you knew was always in your corner. I see a lot of fans think that Kim wrote the letter. Some people think Howard may have written the letter. In fact, on a poll in a Better Call Saul group on Facebook, when asked if they thought Chuck wrote the letter... 363 fans said no, 164 people said yes, and 71 people were undecided. I was one of those who voted yes. I absolutely, positively believe that Chuck wrote the letter. Kim has always respected Jimmy's privacy, and I doubt Howard would ever dare change something in a letter to Jimmy after Kim tore him a new one. The language used in the letter certainly sounded like Chuck, and Jimmy no doubt would be at least a little familiar with his writing style. And I think it's important to remember that this letter was almost certainly written years ago. This is strongly implied because of the HHM mailroom reference. Chuck's obituary from Howard proved that the man was defined by his intellect. Everything was about how smart he was and how much he achieved because of his incredible intelligence. But in the letter... This was about Chuck the person and his relationship with his little brother. And that's why Kim broke down. Because for the first time, she finally saw him as something beyond his tremendous intellect. I don't think what happened was an accident. Who cares what it does to Jimmy, right? As long as Howard Hamlin is okay. Kim, I, I don't think that's fair. Fair? Chuck was sick for years. And after the bar hearing... The bar hearing had nothing to do with it. You tell her your theory? That Chuck intentionally set himself on fire? Well, Howard, I guess that's your cross to bear. Since Chuck's suicide, Jimmy, Kim, and Howard have all been actively passing their guilt on to one another. And in a very real way, they all did things that contributed to Chuck's demise. Chuck was a very ill individual. Chuck wasn't right in the head, and despite being a genius... He was suffering from extreme mental illness. Howard knew this, Kim knew this, and Jimmy knew this all too well. Chuck was a prick, but he was a very sick man. Despite knowing Chuck was such a sick man, they all acted as if he was just a regular prick. Nobody stepped up to help Chuck when he needed it. They all turned a blind eye. And we know Chuck's illness was mental. He will prove this with his slick, quick pickpocket skills or the reverse in this case, and Dr. Cruz outright told Jimmy as much that he should have Chuck committed. Howard didn't give a shit about Chuck the person, his mentor. Howard only cared about the reputation of HHM. Kim knew Howard was ill, and she recognized Jimmy was too close to the situation, but she ultimately fed into Jimmy's delusion that Chuck was better off on his own, and Jimmy screwed up most of all. He blew it when he didn't have Chuck committed. And he did it for selfish reasons because Jimmy was always striving to seek Chuck's approval. And despite his continued best efforts, he never fucking got it. Howard has had his moment of reckoning. Now Kim has had hers. So sooner or later, one way or another, Jimmy will also need to face the music. Or is that what we're actually finally seeing now with Gene? all these years later. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you enjoyed, and have a wonderful night. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercury and molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cerium.